continuação da leitura do livro The New Map. Esse, essa leitura está em inglês. É o capítulo 9, chapter 9. Putin's Great Project. From the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, through the end of the Cold War in 1991, the name of Russia was interchangeable with uh, Soviet Union. The overlap worked because the map of the Soviet, Soviet Union at that time roughly matched with the Russian Empire, save for Poland, which was part of the empire at its maximum, because Moscow was so central, and because the Russian culture and the Russian language so thoroughly dominated the Soviet Union, that in 1991, but the, the Soviet Union collapsed, and 15 newly independent states, states emerged ranging from the tiniest Estonia on the Baltic Sea to Kazakhstan, equal to India in geographic size. Yet the Russian Federation, Russia, still looms over the newly independent states. It sprawls across the map, encompassing 11 time zones from Europe in the west to the tip of the Chukota Peninsula in the far east, just 60 miles across the Bering Strait from Alaska. Its population is only half that of the Soviet Union, and in 2019, its economy was only slightly, slightly larger than Spain. Although Spain has only a third of the population and ceased being a great power in the 18th century, yet Russia still has formed a, 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 a countermance of power. It has scale. It has a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons and missiles that considerable cyber skills. Uh, it has the de determination to project itself on the world stage. And it has natural resources, particularly vast amounts of oil and gas that underpin its place in the world. Three decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a new global competition between the United States and Russia has emerged. Not the Cold War of history and nuclear doomsday, like the day the world ends. But still a Cold War. A it's a conflict between groups. It is playing out in regional conflicts, information warfare, cyberspace, energy and overall relations. Since its interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, Russia has become a toxic subject and a, south, and a source of great rancor in Washington and domestic American politics. Over his two decades as president, Vladimir Putin's great international project has been to reassert Russia's sway, like uh, to cause one to agree, over the rest of the former Soviet Union, restore Russia as a great power globally and build new alliances and to push back against the United States. And whether Russia is partially responsible or not, Putin can point to outcomes that fit his objectives. NATO divided the, the European Union in disarray and America's politics fragmented, nasty, and polarized. Oil and gas have been critical to Russia's be, uh, rebound and, uh, and to the nation's economy. This also provides a way for Russia to, pro to project power other than with military might. As Putin put, put it, Oil is no doubt one of the most important elements in the world's politics, in the world's economy. He was once asked if Russia is an energy superpower. I would prefer to move away from the terminology of the past, he replied. Superpower was the word used during the Cold War. He added, I have never referred to Russia as an honored energy superpower, but we do have great poss greater possibilities than almost any other country in the world. This is an obvious fact. The obvious fact is evident in the sheer scale and abundance of Russia's energy resources. 
It is one of the big three of world oil production. It is the second largest, largest uh, producer of natural gas after the United States and is still the world's largest gas exporter. The earnings from oil and gas exports provide the financial foundation for the Russian state and Russian power. In normal times, 40 to 50% of the government's budget, 55 to 60% of export earnings, and an estimated 30% of GDP. Much more than anything else, these resources make Russia a major player in the world economy. This geological endowment uh, gives Russia global presence. It undergirds, like, uh, undergirds its economy relationship with Europe and growing bond, uh, bonds with China. Yet this reliance is also subject to much debate. Former Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Alexei Kudrin and others have argued that Russia is overly dependent on oil and natural gas, hindering the development of a more balanced and dy dynamic economy. These debates and dilemmas are not new. For a century and a half, Russia, whether the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, or since 1991, the Russian Federation, has been a major player in the world energy while at the same time heavily reliant on oil and then also on gas. Russia's oil industry emerged in the 19th century, both uh, in what uh, today is Azerbaijan, on the western side of the Caspian Sea, around the city of Baku, and northwest of there, and to a lesser degree in Kazakhstan, on the eastern side of Caspian, a British visitor to Baku in the 1880s marveled at what had become the new oil bread, bread, bread basket of Europe. By 1898, Russia overtook the United States to become the world's biggest petroleum producer. But after the re revolution in 1905, the dress re rehearsal, as Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin called it, Russia's once buoyant uh, oil industry languished and declined. In the civil war that followed the, the seizure of power in 1917, the Bolsheviks faced, faced the, uh, they called a few famine, famine, a daunting threat to their revolution. The few crises must be overcome at any cost, said Lenin. We desperately need oil, and anyone who stood in the way, we will slaughter. To help solve their fuel famine, the Bolsheviks nationalized the oil industry. And by the 1920s, the communists were in control of the entire country. Over the next several years, the oil industry recovered and once again became a player in the global market. In the mid-1930s, Joseph Stalin, Lenin's successor, launched purges that engulfed the entire country. The oil industry was not spared, and the secret policy claimed to have discovered a counter-revolutionary wrecking and spying organization throughout the industry. Many of its leaders and workers were either sent to a gulag prison camps or similarly executed. The industry ceased being a major factor outside the Soviet Union. Only in the 1950s, well after the end of the Second World War, did the Soviet uh, Union return as an oil exporter to the global market. This was made possible by new production in the Volga Ural region and then the discovery of advanced new suppliers in the West Siberia. But Russia was exporting into a global market that was already oversaturated with rising amounts of Middle East oil. In response to the surging volumes of Soviet Union, the international companies had reduced prices in 1959 and again in 1960. Enraged at the resulting cut 
in their own revenues, oil exporting countries led by Saudi Arabia and Venezuela came together to form a new organization, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. By the beginning of the 70s, the Soviet Union centrally planned economy was failing. It could not produce the goods that people wanted and what it did produce was shoddy, like badly done or made. Except for specific sectors, mainly defense, the oil crisis in the 70s came just in time. The dramatic increases in petroleum prices delivered a massive surge in revenues that rescued the stagnant, stagnant economy and helped fund a big Soviet uh, military build-up. But this new lease of life would prove only temporarily. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev emerged as the new leader of the Soviet Union. He was young and energetic. He was determined to reform the economy. But fate was against him. The next year, oil prices collapsed, delivering a terrible blow to the Soviet economy and marking the start of what Yegor Gaidar former finance minister and acting prime minister called like the time the timeline of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Oil revenues could no longer mask the failures of the centrally planned economy. We were planning to create a commission, remembered Gorbachev, to solve the problem of women's penthouse pantyhose. Uh, imagine a country that flies into space launches Sputniks, creates such a defense system, and it can't solve the problem of women's pantyhose. There is no toothpaste, no soap, soap powder, not the basic necessities of life. It was incredible and humiliating to work in such a government. It got worse. Oil production began to fall rapidly. In 1989, the chairman of the Council of Ministries bemoaned and complained, if there is no oil, there will be no national economy. While several factors were converging to push the Soviet Union to its demise, like the end of life, the tanking of oil prices severed the, the financial lifetime that had kept the economy afloat and able to continue. The Russian Republic was by far the largest of the republics that is states that compromised to the USSR, Soviet Union, and the, the Union of the Soviet so soci Socialist uh, Republics. All the republics had their own parliament and government agencies, but they had no real power. But now no longer a rubber stamp tool of the Soviet government. The Russian Republic asserted a new authority. It took control of the Soviet oil and gas assets within its territory and of the petroleum revenues that had gone to the all-Union Soviet government. Boris Yeltsin, the president of the Russian Republic, and not Mikhail Gorbachev, was now in charge of the oil money. In December 1991, Boris Yeltsin and the speakers of the Ukrainian and Belarus parliaments met in a forest, in a renting lodge, and over the course of a night facilitated by large amounts of bison grass, vodka, and Soviet-style champagne. They came to a stunning agreement, invoking the status of their three republics as founding states of the USSR in 1922. They declared that the USSR, as a subject of international law and a geopolitical reality, ceases in existence. And on December 25, 1991, Gorbachev delivered to the television 
what one of his aides called like the death notice for the Soviet Union. It was dissolving itself. The formerly powerless const constituent republics would now become independent nations. The Russian Federation, as it became known, would be the main legacy of the Soviet Union that, among other things, required the transfer of the all important codes that control the disposition and use of the vast arsenal of nuclear weapons, but the empty between Gorbachev and Yeltsin was such that they could not agree on who would go to whose office in the Kremlin to, to do um, the transfer. And finally, two sets of military officers, one representing the Soviet Union and, an, and the other the Russian Federation, met in a Kremlin highway uh, for the handover of the codes in Epoch. If, uh, event marked only by a quick exchange of salute. The disintegration of the Soviet Union fractured the integrated uh, edifice of the oil industry and the original base of the western side of the Caspian was now in the newly independent nation of Azerbaijan. The oil of the eastern and the, the, the Capsian uh, now belong to newly independent Kazakhstan. The breakdown of the Soviet economic structures left the giant oil industry of West Siberia fragmented and in disarray. During the spontaneous privatization of the 1990s, a decade uh, that become, became known as the wild 90s, the oil, comp the oil industry in Russia yet was up for grabs. New oil companies began to emerge, gathering us up, up, up assets. Uh, as the decade uh, proce proceeded, the economy rebounded. The, the, the foundations of a, the mar of a market economy were talking or taking, taking shape, and optimism came with it. If there was talk of the Chudo, a Russian economic miracle invoking the economic miracles, in Western Europe and Japan after World War, but then in 1998, the Asian financial crisis engulfed Russia. The rubble collapsed and as did the oil prices, drying up government revenues. The new economy stopped, stopped working and people weren't paid. The credibility of the Yeltsin presidency was shattered. Yeltsin himself was to spend expensive force.